my name's Jason if I haven't met you. <laughs> and there's a good chance that I haven't met you. Um, we have been gone for some weeks over the summer for sabbatical, and it's just good to be home. You know, if there's a certain point where you, if you've had a good break, there's a point where you start begin to clicking, you're clicking your heels and saying, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. So it is good to be home. It's good to be with you. And uh, I was thinking about the last time that I was with you. It was June the 2nd. Today is September the 1st, and so uh, a lot has happened. I know much has happened in uh, your lives. I've uh, been brought up to speed uh, this week and saying, wow, there's a lot that has happened. Good things, great things, hard things. And I recognize all of that, and it's just good to be back with you. Uh, we have prayed for you. We have uh, thought of you often, and uh, you know, we are just uh, excited to be back uh, serving with you uh, today. Uh, I want to do this, I don't want to go any further in our service without uh, recognizing that uh, as I've been gone, as we've been gone, uh, many of you have just stepped up. I want to say thank you to our elders, to our staff, and to so many of you who have served. Would you say thank you to them? Would you do that? I know that, uh, and say, well, Jason just takes care of that. Jason just does that. Not this summer, and uh, it's so, been so good to see. I, I rested fully in the fact that that's going to be handled. It's going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about that. The Lord is good, and his people are able, and so that is fun. Uh, the good news, I have to tell you, uh, is the good news about Jesus has been declared this summer. It's been declared here at Harvest. It's been declared across the country. It's been declared across the world. And I know this, in this place and among us as a church, people have been cared for. People have been loved on. Sin has been challenged in different uh, people's lives. People have been encouraged uh, people have uh, been motivated to follow God's spirit as uh, the Lord just is saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. If you're unfamiliar, by the way, with the term sabbatical, I want you to just rest in this. The word means rest, okay? It comes out of this, this idea of Sabbath, Sabbath, and I'm going to tell you, it's very, very un-American uh, to do that. It's very un-American. Uh, uh, there are other uh, People groups in other countries that do it better than us. And we have some things to learn. I, I think that is important. Today we'll learn some of that. And I want to just begin with this because it's always important to say, well, where were you? What was going on? Just for transparency's sake, there was no crisis. I, I didn't get run out of town. I didn't have to run out of town. Uh, it was intentional. It was intentional. And so as we think about that... Um, it didn't disappear. Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, if you followed along our, our little FAQ sheet on the internet and stuff, this is what's going on. This is what we're doing. We follow a very clear plan. Uh, I met somebody in the store. That's how I began to see people around the valley. You go to Fred Meyer, you're going to see everybody. <laughs> go to Walmart, you're going to see everybody else. If you do it both in a day, you saw the whole valley. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I ran into somebody who doesn't go to Harvest, and uh, you know, I've known them for about 20 years, and they said, hey, how are things going at Harvest? I, I said, I think okay. <laughs> I haven't been there. I've been on uh, sabbatical, and they're like, already? <laughs> it must be nice. I said, actually, we've been, going, uh, we've been up and running as a church for 10 years now. Well, why didn't you take one sooner? <laughs> and I thought, I am not going to win in this conversation. <laughs> get your cereal and get out. <laughs> That's what I did. I wasn't telling them to get out. You're wondering about that. I got my cereal and got out. That's how it was. But uh, I, I'm going to tell you, it was good. It was good to be uh, away and it's good to be back. Uh, we followed a very clear plan as we were gone, uh, that we were intentional about what we were doing. Uh, it was directed to us through a ministry called Cross Point Ministries. And they work with uh, churches and ministry leaders just to say, be really intentional about what you're doing. One, we know that Satan loves to destroy people and he loves to destroy ministries. So you better be aware. And you, you need to be able to, if you're going to shepherd other people, you need to be shepherding yourself. And you need to be under the good shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. And so as we did that, we followed a plan and uh, it really had three stages. The first stage of the plan was to 
rest. And I'm going to tell you, they told me this, but they said, you probably find it difficult in the first two weeks because if you're used to running at a certain pace and you try to slow it down, it doesn't feel good at first. And that, it, it was, it was wonky, it was weird, it was, uh, it was different, uh, yet they're like, hang in there, do it. And so we, we did this, followed the plan of rest, to step back from ministry and intentionally slow our pace and focus on Christ. And the first thing we did is uh, we went, uh, flew into Detroit, Michigan. That's where family is in Michigan. We spent some time uh, with family, extended family. We celebrated birthdays. We celebrated uh, baby showers, things that we'd never get to do except through Facebook and FaceTime and face it, you're far away. Um, <laughs> we celebrated birthdays, baby showers, and just being together. And it was, it was really, um, it was refreshing. And then we jumped in a rental van and we just, I, I feel bad for whoever buys that rental van after this <laughs> because we put some serious miles on it. Uh, we went to the east, uh, the east coast, and we uh, went all over the place just taking in uh, ministries and opportunities that we don't normally get to see. Would you put that picture up of, I think this is uh, the picture, here we are. This is in the Capitol uh, Rotunda there in Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, this is, this is fun. We went to our senator's office. My wife did a great job organizing this, by the way. I should say thank you to her. Thank you. And uh, we went, and as we were going through the tunnels to the Capitol, I walked past this guy, and I'm like, that's Bill Gates. And he looked at me and was like, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> that was our only celebrity moments of the whole time. Like, that was him. He was about this far from me, but I'm sure that the other guys with him would have probably uh, taken, taken me down <laughs> quickly if I would have said, can I have your autograph <laughs> or some of your money? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But uh, we, we got to go and just take that in. Um, that it was just a, a great time to see uh, some of the history that you don't get to see very often. One of the things that we did along the way is we uh, visited numerous ministries. Wherever we went, uh, we, we got to take in uh, different churches and different styles. And we worshiped Jesus at many different churches. And I was so encouraged that although stylistically very different across what the churches that we took in, very different, some of the songs we knew and some of the songs were like, what was that? What was that? Uh, de different demographics. I loved it when we were uh, in a church that we're the minority and we're like, oh, this is different and good and good. The world is a big place. And uh, I'm going to tell you, as the name of Jesus was celebrated in each of those churches and churches where pastors wore collars and churches where pastors just had a T-shirt on, it didn't matter because the focus wasn't on the pastor. The focus was on Jesus. And so just coming home from that is refreshing. God is at work. If you're wondering today, if, if there's some things going on in your life today and you're wondering, is God at work? I, I'm just gonna tell you, he is. He's at work. When you see him, when it's clear, and when you're wondering, he is at work. Uh, so, so good. So that's just the rest part of the sabbatical. The second part of the plan was to recalibrate to address some of the areas that, uh, where we lack attention, uh, when you're busy in a full schedule and, and you, just, you just need to have some headspace to be able to take it in a little bit more. And so that recalibrate time. During this time, uh, I did some solitude at a cabin. I'm gonna tell you, I don't spend a ton of time uh, in my life alone. It was good and disturbing. Because I was like, okay, it's me. Still me. Okay, hours have passed and still me. God uses it. God uses that. Where he can speak to you and the, the distractions of, of life are, are just uh, not there. Uh, one of the things that uh, God used in my life and has been so refreshing to me in that recalibrate time was an app 
an app. Would you put that picture up of the app there? I, I want you to see this. Bible in one year. Bible in one year. You can go to your app store right now. It doesn't matter what you have. If you have a, a smartphone or smart device at all and you say, hey, I, wanna, I want something that would be refreshing to my soul. Uh, that's it. Uh, that I say, where did, you get, where did you get this? Where did you get this? My wife's been using it for a long time. She's like, you want to check this out. And I had enough space to listen to her. And... Um, <laughs> And I'm going to just tell you that God used that in my life uh, just in this way. Uh, the author is a British pastor, a vicar. I'm like, what? what is that? <laughs> Who launched this ministry uh, called Alpha. Alpha is uh, a ministry geared to introducing people who have never heard of Jesus Christ or have a very inaccurate picture of Jesus Christ to what Christianity is a safe place to come and ask questions, a safe place to come and, and just find out more. And God has used this all over the world. And so he was like, now, now that people, as people are coming to, to Jesus, we need to keep encouraging them. One of the ways that they need to be encouraged is to be in God's word. And so he took one of those Bible reading plans. Maybe you get one at the beginning of the year and say, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. And then it lasts through like January 15th. And, uh, this Bible in one year that he took it and digitized it. And uh, it, I just found it so refreshing. I had a notebook out and I listened to it as it goes through uh, the Psalms or a proverb, an Old Testament passage, a New Testament passage, and they all coincide with a, a theme. And so it was just so good. Uh, I just want you to get a little taste of it today. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll download it while I'm on Wi-Fi, wherever I'm at on Wi-Fi. And uh, then you can listen to it wherever you want. But uh, here, here's a little taste of it. And so uh, here we go. I'm going to hold it up to my mouth so it's going to look weird for a moment. <laughs> Just rest in that. Rest in that. Here it is. This is the Bible in one year, day 244. Find your purpose in life. There he is. What a waste, said a woman to my friend. This woman was talking about Bishop Sandy Miller, who'd practiced very successfully as a lawyer for 10 years before leaving it all behind to become an ordained minister in the church. A waste, exclaimed my outraged friend. Yes, said the woman, such a waste. He could have made a fortune and been at the very top of the legal profession. Think of what he could have achieved. Think of what he has achieved, replied my friend who was thinking of the impact of Sandy's ministry on thousands of people around the world whose lives... Then he'll take that, and he'll take us to the Psalms, and the guy, uh, what, 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 who's the guy, the voice of the guy who does it? He's off of like Narnia or something. Yeah, another British guy uh, who said... By the way, every time uh, I would listen to this, I felt compelled that I had to repeat it. Uh, Bible in one year, day 244. <laughs> I don't know why, I felt like I had to do that so I could be a part of it, but then I would just take, I'd be taking notes, and here's what I found. As I, I was taking notes, I was catching some things that I wouldn't just in my normal reading, and so I'm listening and taking notes, and here's the beautiful thing, if he was moving too fast or, or something, I can pause it, I can scroll back, I can do that, and, and God just used this in my life. Uh, this guy, Nicky, he, uh, he was in the legal profession as well in England. And when he came to know Christ, God just said, all right, I've got, uh, I've got other plans for you, but the Lord has used it. He's used it in my life. Now, listen, I know this. You're like, I would hate that. It's okay. I'm just going to tell you that this is part of what God used to help me just rest in and hear from him and recalibrate and refresh my soul, the Bible in one year. If that would bless you, go get it. You know, go get it. It's free. It's just one of those fun things uh, uh, where I say, all right, that, that was good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for simple things like that that are free. Uh, love it. Love that. And so as I look at it, the Bible in one year, that, that was one of the things that the Lord used in my life. Uh, the third step in the, the sabbatical process, and you're like, what does this have to do with me? Hang in. Hang in there. It's, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, we're... The, the worship team said, if you just need to go long today, Jason, go long. <laughs> and so many, it was more, I'm paraphrasing what, what they said. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. But um, 
it was good. The third step is, th is this, re-entry. So first rest, then recalibrate, then re-entry. This is, this is the beauty of having some coaching along the way. Uh, what has the Lord been speaking and impressing on you that he might have for us in this next season of ministry? That's the re-entry portion. That's what uh, I'm in right now, is that we're just saying, hey, the Lord has plans for us. Not just for me, the Lord has plans for us. One of the things that the Lord has impressed upon me that this is his church, I can rest and trust him. Uh, just, just grateful this summer, I didn't worry like, oh no, I hope everything's okay. I can rest and say this, Lord, that's your church. Those are your people, this is your work. And because it's his work and that he wants me to be a part of it and that he wants you to be a part of it, that he has an expectation that we would join in to what he is doing. And what he is doing is something that we've talked about for 10 years. And what is Jesus doing in our world? What is he doing in our valley right now? He is leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. He is doing that right now. He's doing that right now. And I, I love that. I can rest in that. One of the profound statements I listened to came out of the Bible in one year, day 215. Um, it was a profound statement, and I wrote it down because I was like, that's good, is that we, as his people, as Christians, as people who call on the name of, of Jesus, we need to have two things. Not just two things, but definitely two things. We need to have soft hearts, and we need to have hard feet. Let me give you a little understanding of that as it was fleshed out for me. Soft hearts and hard feet. You see, in this world, we can have very easily a hard heart, a cynical heart, a heart that is jaded toward people. We can have hard hearts and soft feet. We get mad at people. We get mad at people because uh, they don't know Jesus yet and they're not behaving well. They're behaving in selfish, destructive ways. We get mad at them we can get a hard heart very quickly as we watch the news, as we see things happen in our own families, as we, as we look around our community and we say, why are they doing that? Why is that going on? They deserve what they get and we can have a hardened heart very quickly. We can get a hardened heart toward Christians who are not behaving as we think they should or they're not behaving like us. And that might be simple things like how fast they do things or how slow they do things or the way they do things. A hardened heart will paralyze you from doing what God wants you to do because your, your eyes are focused on others in a wrong way. You're upset about them and you're upset about them and you're upset about them. And when the Lord's saying, I'm trying to talk to you, but you won't listen because you're so focused on other people in the wrong way. We have hardened hearts. We can get a hardened heart very quickly and we can tend to have soft feet. What does that mean, soft feet? That's a, that's a different kind of term. Soft feet means you don't have calluses built up. You get tired very easily. You don't serve very well when it gets difficult. Soft mean, feet means that we're not willing to serve the people around us because it just simply costs us too much emotionally, physically, uh, financially. It's just too much. And it's true that in America, we are uh, a consumer culture. Not, not just some people, we are. We're consumers. We like to be catered to. We like that. We want people to minister to us, but the fact is that every Christian was not... Uh, necessarily just called to be ministered to. Yes, the Holy Spirit does that for us, but we are called to minister and to use the gifts that God has given to each of us. Gifts that he would call us to say, join in this. Uh, I, I had a chance to, to uh, visit some other ministries even here in our community last week. I went to uh, Foursquare, Foursquare on 40th. And uh, I wanted to see the transition between Pastor Dave Edler and now his son who has taken over, uh, Jacob Edler. And last week as Jake was speaking, uh, he was saying that we have hard hearts and soft feet. 
He said it in this way. He said, some of you expect that yeah, pastors, you're supposed to do all the work. Pastors, you're supposed to do all the work. And he said, yes, we are to work and we're to work hard on behalf of the Lord. That's good. And then he began to call out some uh, other pastors from around the valley. And he said, they're in it with us and they're in it with us and they're in it with us. And they're in it. He looked right at me and was like, and Jason at Harvest. And I was like, oh, I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> Don't look at me. And uh, he was just saying, come on into the mess. All of us, come on in. Come on into the mess. We need to build up, build up some calluses, be willing to serve people, to see their physical needs, emotional needs, uh, all, all the things that they have around us, to leave the bench. There should be, at this point, uh, so many on the field that looks like the, the game is over, that people have entered into the game, so many of us. I want to give you just a few ways that you might think about this, even this fall. Calling you to not have a hardened heart and not to have soft feet, but to come into the game and use the gifts that God has given to you. And if you don't know what that is, that's the, one of the only ways to really discover that is to get involved. Here's a few ways. Be a part of our Adopt-A-School opportunity right here this year at Sela Intermediate School. That we would come in and say, well, I don't have much time. Okay, then come and read, help students read for this amount of time. You, you give what you, you, you can. You, you jump in and do it. Well, I, could, I can't do that, but I can do this. There are lots of opportunities. There's lots of opportunities. Come and be a part of that. I know this, that there are lots of opportunities to serve right here. I know that our children's ministry, they, they need people to volunteer each week. Doesn't mean even teaching. It means just serving and helping and, and, and being a part of that. Flip said, hey, put that on your connection card if you're interested in that. I know over here at the coffee area, we, we want somebody to just say, hey, would you be available to lead? You don't even have to make a cup of coffee. Come and help us just organize that every other month. Come and be a part of that. Hey, come and uh, jump in and wait a second. Does it all have to be right here at Harvest? No, no. Uh, maybe you want to serve at the mission. Maybe you want to just help your neighbor who's struggling with their health or, or their finances and, and they just need some extra attention right now. All you have to do is go across your front yard and God open an opportunity. Say, well, I don't know, the, the grass is so sharp, that's called soft feet. <laughs> How about serving at the jail? How about creating a new opportunity that doesn't even exist because the Lord's been laying it on your heart and saying, you know what we should do? You know what we should do? If he's laying that on your heart, he's calling you to help start it, to help it get going. Here's what I, I want us to, to consider, that we would have soft hearts for people. You'll understand that as we get into God's word today. Soft hearts for people. The people that God brings across your path. Be careful of developing a calloused heart and keeping soft feet. Yes, calluses can be good. <coughs> calluses on the feet. Calluses on the hands can be a good, good thing. Calluses on the heart, never good. In the middle of entering the work that God has for us this fall, we will need to work at remembering the pressure is not on us. The pressure's not on us. That our community and our world are loved by God, and that includes us. And this is, this is the truth, and here's where the, the sermon should make sense for each of us today. We need to learn how to work at rest. Work at rest. Work at resting in the truth that God is in control. He's got it with or without you. He's got it with or without you. But he has chosen, he has chosen to say, I want you. I want you. Come into the fray. Come in and get it on you. Get messy. Love people. Build up some calluses. 
And, and yet, sometimes resting, as, as this has been good for me, resting doesn't feel spiritual, and so we don't do it well, which then impacts our work. And it's a vicious cycle. Why is resting so difficult? It, it, it seems, and this is true, it seems that for Christians, they say, if it's really of God, it should just happen. It should just happen. Cue the sparkles and the glitter. It should just happen. Rest. Rest, rest, rest. In fact, you know that this weekend, this Labor Day weekend, is a big weekend of what for America? Rest. Rest. Labor Day 2019, it is the 125th anniversary of Labor Day in the United States. Started by the labor movement, the first Monday in September is a creation of the labor movement and dedicated to social and economic achievements of the American worker, and we celebrate the American worker by resting. Resting. That's a good way to, to celebrate work, is to rest. Uh, we, we celebrate that there is prosperity, there is well-being, there is strength. Because people work, that's a good thing. And we celebrate that by resting. Right now, this weekend, it is called a holiday, a holy day. Bible in one year, day 216. A holy day encouraging people in their work by resting. I, I just want you to, you don't have to answer this, or if you want to tell your neighbor around you, that's, that's up to you. How, how are you at resting? How are you at resting? How do you holiday? How do you holiday? I want, to, I want to show you just a few ways that people around the U.S. holiday and rest on this Labor Day weekend. Let, let's just show this first picture here. Ah, there it is. Camping. A lot of people camping this weekend. If you're here in the Northwest where it's so dry, you sit around a fire pit that you can't light on fire. <laughs> One of the most discouraging things when uh, our kids were uh, small, I think maybe just we just had Chloe as a baby. We went up to Ohanapakash. Oh, man, that place is beautiful. And they said, no fires. No fires. It gets dark. <laughs> and, you know, what we did, we had a lantern. <laughs> Put that in there. Gather around. <laughs> oh, wait, it's electric. Camping, camping, people rest and they'll say, this is our last shot to rest for the summer, for the whole, the whole year. It's our last, it's not your last time. But it might be your last opportunity to do one of these activities. Let's look at the next one here. Some people say, I've got to rest, especially if you live in the high desert and you say, I've got to see some water. I've got to see some water. Listen, going back east, it was so great. We got to see a lot of water. In fact, the air was filled with water. <laughs> so much that you couldn't breathe. <laughs> Every day filled with water. We got caught in the flash flood alert. It was the weirdest thing. If you've ever seen an amber alert happen on your phone, we're in downtown Philadelphia, and all of a sudden, all the phones all around us, and I said, flash flood alert. Sun is out. We're like, Psh from the desert. We don't need that. We're in taking a little tour of a printing press and you notice that everything outside grew dark. <laughs> and then Noah went by. <laughs> and this is what they said. They said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. We have another tour coming in. And we're like, no. <laughs> Did you see it outside? We went outside. We got drenched in like three seconds. Sometimes water can be refreshing just to, just to have a change of pace. Many people headed to the coast or just to be around it. How about this? Some people rest just by simply doing this. I just, it doesn't matter where I'm at. I just need to put my feet up and do nothing. Just put my feet up and do nothing. What's on your checklist today? Nothing. That's a great way to rest. That's okay. Some people that would drive them crazy. Other people say, I need that. Some people say, let's show the next one. I want to put my feet up, but I want to be able to, uh, I want to be able to read. I want to do something that I want to do, something that fills up my tank. I want to, I want to uh, watch a football game. That's how I rest. Okay, that's, that's great. Let's, the next one, here's how, oh man. 
Yeah. Have some friends over, barbecue. Everything goes better with food. Everything goes better with food. And you say, this is how we rest. We, we, it's, it's friends and food, and that's, that's so good. And then this last one, this is so important because it's s'mores. <laughs> you say, uh, man, I can't have s'mores because... Uh, no, you need to have that. You need it, actually. <laughs> s'mores are great. It's the end of the summer. This is so good. Many people rest in different ways. Your style didn't appear on the screen. That's okay there, because there's a thousand ways that people find what fills their tank. But maybe you've never worked at resting. Perhaps you've over-spiritualized it and said, if it's going to be, God will just cause it to happen. If it's true rest, it will just happen. How many of you in making a s'more said, if it's going to be, it'll just happen? A marshmallow will jump out of the bag, jump into the fire, perfectly roast itself, race toward my mouth, being chased by chocolate and graham cracker, and then combine in just the right moment. Does it happen? If it did, I want to see that on YouTube. You know, please video that. Please do that. I want to see it. We need to learn how to rest. We need to learn how to work. We need to learn how to value what God values. And so today, I want us to do this. I haven't done it in a few months, so let's see if I can get it right. If you have a Bible this morning, uh, would you take it out? Let's be in God's Word together. Let's hear from what the Lord has to say about people, work, and rest today. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. If you're using the app, uh, please use that. We're going to be in the first book of your Bible, the book of origins. That's what Genesis means. It's the book of beginnings. And we'll be in Genesis actually chapter 1. You don't have to go very far to see that God has a lot to say about relationships. He has a lot to say about work. And he has a lot to say about rest. And so I want you to see this. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 27 and down through Genesis 2 verse 3. And so that you can see that the Lord is, is serious about these things. And we need to be serious about what he's serious about. Here it is. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says this. So, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If we stop there, there's so much to unpack from just that. Man and woman both created in the image of God, both having just value, both uh, created equal in his image. Just, just don't stop there. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, that's my least favorite part, everything that has breath, the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold would you just say this out loud with me because it's important he saw that everything he had made and behold it was Amen. he doesn't make garbage he only makes what is good i want you to think that about what does that say about you what does it say about your neighbor what does it say about the person down the street from you behold it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested. Would you underline that in your Bible? That's the first time you'll ever see that term. He rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy, a holiday, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. We're going to stop right there because God has some things for us. I want you to think about this regarding people, about work, and about rest today. 
that you need to understand why it's important that you have God's perspective on this and not just your own. And I find one of the things that help, is helpful uh, to ask whenever you come to God's word or maybe you're facing something difficult in life, you should ask this question, why? 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 Ask this of yourself first and then ask it of others second. Ask of yourself, why do I have that opinion? Why do I have that opinion? Why do I think this way? Why do I behave that way? And then you can move to others and say, why do you behave that way? Parents, you know this when you're dealing with your kids. You'll have this question for them when they're doing something that you find odd or not good. And you say something like this. Why are you doing that? Let's, not, let's make sure you're, you're, you're saying it like you would say it to your kids. Why are you doing that? And then as they get older and they ask you the same question, Mom, why are you doing that? Dad, why are you doing that? Why do you say that? Why do you behave that way? What? Why? 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 I think that's a great question and it's a valuable question to be able to come and see as we open the scriptures and say, why is this being shown to us? Why is God making sure that he spent time and, and showing us this, this truth out of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2? Oh, would you write this down? Make sure you get this. Number one, why value people? Why value relationships? Why do that? Why should I value people? Why should I value relationships? Well, it's good. It's nice. My Sunday school teacher said I should. Why? Because my mom said I should. Why? Because the Bible said I should. Why? And you're like, that's obnoxious. <laughs> Why? Why is that obnoxious? I think the Lord is, is happy to say, I, I have some things that I want you to understand. I want you to know what you're doing. Why value people in relationships? Here's, here's two simple reasons out of God's word today. <clears throat> because this, people are made in the image of God. He made them. And all he makes is good. Very good. In fact, it's only on the day that he created people in his image that he named anything very good. Very good. By the way, let's just do this. We have just started the school year and maybe some folks are not even into it yet, but what type of speech is very? Anybody? Come on, this is English 101. Very? I can't hear you. I'm old. I've aged. These, these here. What is very? Adjective? Adverb? Mm -hmm. Some of you are like, I need to Google that. <laughs> what is Google? <laughs> A helpful tool. When he says it's very good, he wants, to, you, he wants you to latch on to this is not just okay. This is not just nice. This isn't like, yeah, I like the other stuff. This, this is another level. This is very good. People are made in the image of God. That means the best thing I can tell you is that we were meant to reflect him. That we were meant to, if you hold that up in the, into the light and it, and it reflects, ah, that's good. That's, that's not just good. That's very good. That's very good. People are made in the image of God. But don't miss this. Why value people in relationship? Number two is this. We value people because God does. I'm a keep it simple person. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Why should I value people who don't act like me, who never grew up like me? Why should I value them at all? Why should I value people? Why should I value relationships? Because God does. God values them. He values them. He values men. He values women. He values uh, families. He, he has plans for families across the globe. I'm going to tell you one of the best things that happened to us is that we were in New York City. Whoa, 
that is not Yakima. <laughs> that was a good, good experience for us. And we were trying to get back to where we were staying in New Jersey. And uh, we were dead. We had, we had walked everywhere that day. And we went down into the train station below ground. And below, it was so hot. And it smelled. And the train was broken down. And we're like, we just want to get back to New Jersey. How many people say that? <laughs> we just want to get back to New Jersey. And so people are piling up on the platform for the train. And finally they say, <laughs> which means, I don't know what it means, but a train did come. And four trains worth of people piled onto one train. I'm going to tell you, it's tough to value people at times. <laughs> and we were so boxed into there, and it was, it was such a cultural experience. Multiple languages going on. Every shade, height, age, all crammed together, body to body. And as we went down, I was like, all right, Lord, you are creative. But this guy smells <laughs> bad. And I'm going to tell you, you see, it, it was a beautiful picture of what God says. I value every single one of these people. I, I know every one of their names. I know what, where they come from. I know where they're going. And I know that at the cross, I declared that they are valuable. He knew they were valuable. He's their creator. But at the cross, he's saying, they're valuable. They're valuable. They're valuable to me, therefore they should be valuable to you. Why should we value people and relationships? We value people because God does. Because God does. Number two, would you write this down? Why value work? This is a funny one for Labor Day. Why value work? And... And this is one of those things I, I think so many people have misunderstood what work is. So many people get it wrong regarding work. They think work is a result of sin. And you're like, you don't know my coworkers. It is the result of sin. You don't know what I have to do each day. It is a result of sin. Actually, we work, don't, notice this, why value work? We work because God works. He works, and he, even though here it says he finished his work in creation, but don't you believe that he is done working? He is at work to this very minute, amen? amen. Listen, if you have something you say, I don't know what God's gonna do in this situation, I want you to rest in this truth that he is at work. You might not see it right now. You might not know what he's going to do, but he is at work to this very minute. He's at work. So it said in Genesis that he finished his work. He finished his work in creation. Make sure you read the text in context. He finished that work and he rested. Not because he was winded. He rested so he could enjoy his creation. It's called a holiday. So that he could enjoy his creation. So that he could enjoy what he had made. We value work because God works. And we work to change the world. If you notice this, he said, I want you to multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. I want you to have dominion over it. I want you to, to do this. I, I want you to have impact across this globe. I want you to, to work. I want you to work. So this globe reflects me more and more each day. More and more each day. When you go to work, and it might be as you work at home, it might be as you work at your job, it might be as you, as you work in ministry in some way, that you go to bring God-honoring change. God-honoring change. Why should we value work? We value it because God works. Number three, why value rest? Why value rest? We rest 
because God rests. We rest because God rests. It's as simple as that. We value people because God values people. We work because God works. We were made to work. We were made to value people. We were made to rest. We rest because God rests. We rest in order to recognize God's authority. If we will not rest, if we will not learn how to rest in our work, it's really saying, I don't trust you, God. And I'm going to continue to do what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be in charge. And I'm going to make sure everything goes the way I want. And you're just going to hold on tight. You're going to hold on tight. That really makes you the boss. That really makes you God. That really does, says, I don't think you have good plans in store for me or for this world. Why value rest? We rest because God rests. We rest in order to recognize God's authority. And finally, this is just as simple as it gets as he, he sums it up. We rest in order to value relationships and work properly. If you don't learn how to rest, and I don't mean just sleep, okay? If you, if you have that idea of rest, that's, that's okay. That's a part of it. Your body needs to rest each day. but that you would learn how to value work properly. If you don't rest, your work will decline. If you don't learn how to rest, you won't have, you won't have margin in your life. Pastor Kevin, who spoke at the retreat, spoke about margin. If you don't learn how to rest, you won't have space in your life, emotionally, mentally, for people who take up space emotionally and mentally and spiritually and physically and and you say I don't have space for you that's because you haven't learned how to rest you haven't learned how to rest why do we value rest Be rest because God rests we rest in order to recognize God's authority we rest in order to value relationships and work properly now this idea of relationships work and rest is totally screwed up in our culture because of sin and pride Sin and pride get in the way of, of established order that God put in place. I love that God is a God of order. Not cold and, and lifeless. Beautiful. Beautiful and, and valuable. So, so important. You see, this is the truth. We can tend to be selfish and we don't value people properly. Selfishness is not valuing people properly. We can tend to underwork, that's laziness, or overwork, which usually means it's a form of idolatry and that may, we're God and he's not. We tend to kill ourselves and then say, I'm going to take a, a great vacation and that will totally refresh me. One of the things I received in coaching just before we began in, uh, the sabbatical and all the way through said, if something's broken, sabbatical doesn't fix it. If something's broken, sabbatical doesn't fix it. And that's true. That's true. Where you come and say, I'm going to put all my hope in a vacation at the end of the year. And when I get to that vacation, I'll totally be refreshed and I won't have, I'll, I'll, you know, that's not how it works. That's a good thing. That, look forward to that. That's great. But you need to learn how to rest every day. You need to learn how to rest in Jesus you need to know how to have a, a healthy rhythm to your life. In fact, I want to give you just a, a few practical things that you can hang on to. Saying, how do I value people and work and rest rightly? How do I value them rightly? Here they are. This one, uh, I, I read in a book <laughs> from another pastor. And I just have latched onto it and thought, oh, that's so good. That preaches. Let's preach it. Here it is. Have a finish line. It sounds, it sounds so simple. Have a finish line to your day. Have a finish line to your week. Have a finish line to your month. Have a finish line. Have a finish line. Learn how to see something through and then celebrate it. Have a finish line. One of the things I took on uh, in, at the end of my sabbatical was reorganizing my garage. That is important. 
but not fun. In fact, some of your, our neighbors came by and they saw when I had pulled everything out into the driveway. They're like, what's happening? <laughs> it looks like a yard sale, <laughs> but it's not. It's a total reorganization. But there had to come to a point where you say, I'm going to work at this, I'm going to work at this. And there's a certain point where like, and that's done for now. Guess what? My garage is messy again. <laughs> Does that ever happen to anybody else around here? Come on, show of hands. Does that ever happen? I organized this and it's messy again. It's kind of like this. I washed my clothes and they did not stay clean. Can you believe it? I can. Wash them again. Wash them again. Have a finish line to your day, your week. It, it's just so practical. Know that that's enough. That's enough for today. That's enough for this week. That's enough on this project. That's enough. To be able to say to yourself, that's enough. To recognize that you're not the Savior. Recognize that you're not the Savior. Recognize that uh, you can do everything right and still things go wrong. One of the things that's important to recognize is that we have an enemy who is against us and who tends toward chaos and tends toward destruction and tends toward hating everything good in this life, including work, rest, and relationships. And so you say, well, I, I, I did my very best and, and they still made bad choices and this still went wrong and this still happened. And you know what? You're not the Savior. You need to rest in this that Jesus can take care of that. Number three, here it is. Serve the Savior. This is where you come and say, I need to, I need to have some calluses on these feet. Serve the Savior and people with joy. Serve the Savior and people with joy. Find something that you say, I love, this is, this is something that I love to do, this is some way I can contribute, this is some way I can, I can give back to the kingdom, serve him with joy. There's no, there's no profit in it, there's nothing great for the kingdom if you just say, I'll do it, but I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy about it. Well, then you should find something else to do where you can serve with joy. Where you can serve and say, that was good. It was hard, but it was good. Number four. This one, I think, is just <coughs> learning to practice this every day. Celebrate the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Celebrate it. I'm going to tell you that uh, in, in churches of, of multiple different styles, we got to sing and celebrate the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we got to hear uh, people proclaim, Jesus has changed me. Jesus is changing me, and one day I will ultimately be changed. People with uh, totally different backgrounds, people with different education levels, different ages for sure, and yet Jesus at work and that and saying, I'm not the same. I celebrate Jesus and his finished work on my behalf. Here's the best thing you can do. If you have not put your faith, faith in Jesus, today you come and stop striving to either be a good person or try to figure out all of life on your own and, and, and to do all of this without him and you come and you rest in the finished work of Jesus at the cross who said, it is finished. It is finished. We read in Genesis about the finished work of Jesus at creation. At the cross, we learn about the finished work of Jesus in salvation. And he's inviting you into that rest. Come, have your sins forgiven. Rest in me. Rest in me. Stop striving. I'm going to tell you, as, as I look at this, there's no way I could do justice to all the things that God uh, maybe taught me or showed me in one sermon, or we'd be here a while. 
And I want you to be able to rest this Labor Day weekend. I want you to be able to rest. And I, I just want you to personalize it here. Ask yourself these questions. How am I doing in valuing work? How am I doing in valuing rest? How am I doing in valuing relationships? Which one of these areas is the most out of alignment for me right now in, in my life? Oh, they're all, which one? Which one? That's the one you bring to Jesus first. I'm out of alignment in my work. I'm out of alignment in my rest. I'm out of alignment in how I see and value people because I don't value them. You bring that to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, continue your work in me. His work at creation is done. His work at, in salvation is done, but his work is not done in you or in me. He has a lot to do in us this fall. That's good news, amen? He has a lot to accomplish in us. You're looking down the road and they, he has a lot to accomplish in them. You look at yourself first. Lord, do what only you can do and change me and change me and change me. Help me to value what you value. Would you join me as we ask the Lord to help us with that? Father in heaven, it is so good to be back, <laughs> but you never left. Father, this is your church. These are your people. This is your work. Thank you that you showed us from the beginning that there are some things that we need to value simply because you value them. Lord, help us to value people. Help us to value relationships. Help us to value them because you do. Lord, help us to value work. I pray, uh, Lord, for those that are in need of work in this place, give them work. For those that are out of balance in their work, maybe they're underworking, they're lazy. Or they're overworking and they're trying to be in control of all things. Lord, help us to value work in the way you see it. Jesus, help us to rest. Help us to rest in you. You're so good. You know the needs of every person here. I pray that everything that is on our hearts, we would come and we'd lay it at your feet and we would not scoop it up, but we'd leave it there and we'd trust you to know that you can work. Lord, we love you. Lord, for those that don't know you in this place today, I pray that they would simply come and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I need to rest in your finished work at the cross where you said I'm valuable. I want to follow you. Thank you, Jesus. In this place and in this church, among this people, we say glory to God. Amen? Amen. Amen.